uh, monitoring that goes on. We are responsible for um, coral reef restoration and um, research. Next. So our NOAA goals, we also have four cross-cutting goals. So we've got those line offices. And so we're um, interested in these four topics, and that is ecosystems, climate, weather and water, and commerce and transportation. So you can see why we're stuck in the Department of Commerce there. Because the functions that we perform, if we did not do those, commerce and transportation in the United States would halt. Because we, you know, all the 95% of the, of the stuff that comes in the United States comes via ocean. Um, we also do the GPS systems, marine charting, and all that kind of stuff, and all that has to do with commerce and transportation. But we also have a very, because we have the National Weather Service, and we're, we're mandated to be monitoring the oceans and coasts, um, we collect a lot of weather data, which over time becomes climate data. So we have one of the mandates to observe, monitor, and try to understand climate, climate modeling and what's going on. The ecosystems is to protect, restore, and manage the use of coastal and ocean resources. And we have, and I'll show you in just a minute, we have a lot of, next slide, a lot of facilities. And here's the, uh, the climate analysis that we're, we've been mandated to do. And that mandate, of course, with a lot of the recent interest, well, let's say not recent interest, let's say mm, understanding by the powers that be that maybe this is a, a, a worthwhile and an important topic that we should know more about. There's a lot more money coming now to some of the federal agencies who have a, a, a figure in the pie of climate. And so you'll see a lot more activity, both in education and in science monitoring of climate, climate change. Next. So our facilities, we have uh, a lot of facilities nationwide. We have 600 um, presences within the United States. Some of these are large. Um, marine labs, some of them are large, like the National Hurricane Center or the National Climate Data Center. Some of these are large facilities. Some of these are, are relatively small. We have a presence in every state of the union. Some of that is because of the National Weather Service. It's a lot of our primary responsibility lie along the coastlines, but we do have presence in the interior because we have a lot of responsibility for the Great Lakes and um, then, of course, for the Weather Service. I'll explain some of that in a minute. And we also go out to all of the Pacific Islands territories and some of the Caribbean as well. Uh, next slide. So, uh, exploration in the ocean can be just as challenging as uh, exploration in our space. And uh, it's okay. Um, and I'm going to say this to my NASA counterpart, Dave. Uh, you guys don't have to deal with octopi in space hanging on to your stuff. Um, and we also have to deal with um, deep temperatures, cold water, high pressure. So, they, you know, there's, there's many challenges for studying the depths of the ocean as there is for studying space. And so we do have a lot of common in terms of, of, of overcoming some of those challenges. I love the octopi sitting on top of that robotic arm. I don't know how they ever got them off because they're very inquisitive creatures. Next. So we have developed a lot of tools for exploration. A lot of them have to do with robotics and automatic underwater vehicles. Um, we do use divers in various kinds of specialized suits. We have a lot of observation tools, satellites. The GOES satellites are our responsibility. Um, and we have a lot of submersibles. Next. And in order to use some of those, we have also developed some inner space centers. So our inner space centers are facilities that are command centers. They use internet to connections. Um, there are six of them at the present time. One of them is at NOAA in Silver Spring, where I'm at, I am at. And the others are at um, higher ed institutions. There's one at the University of Rhode Island that was developed in partnership with Bob Ballard, um, puts hold, and it's a collaborative. In fact, the Inner Space Centers is really a brainchild of Bob Ballard. Um, he wants to be able to sit at a control center and with a joystick, move the joystick, which is actually giving signals to a, an underwater robotic vehicle, an ROV, to move certain places, and then the real-time data comes back to the console, and they're actually seeing what's going on. And they're not on the ship. But the ship might be in the Arctic, or it might be in the middle of Black Sea, or it might be, in one case, the monitor um, wreck off the coast of North Carolina. And so these command centers allow scientists to not have to go shipboard, but to be able to do research in in real time. And so these do use the, uh, the internet to connection. 
Uh, we do have a pilot high school in our space center at Springfield High School in Rhode Island. And they are now developing a curriculum. In fact, I talked to them two weeks ago. They're going to develop an entire school-wide science curriculum based around oceanography that is going to utilize that inner space center in a better way. Uh, so it's an asset that's just in its infancy in terms of getting started. But this allows a student to actually have control of an ROV in the bottom of the ocean somewhere, which is way cool. Um, so these are some of the ROVs that, uh, that we have as options. They come in very many varieties, shapes, sizes. Uh, unmanned. We do have manned. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, you see we have some really large unmanned. Um, this is Hercules. He's very large. He goes down to 13,000 feet. So we have lots of toys to play with. Um, but the, the trick is, how do you use the toys to best advantage in the classroom? That's our challenge. And how do you get some of these inner space centers, which have very particular technology, um, to be able to be used in a curriculum in a way that's effective for the teachers too? Next. So we have 13 uh, national marine sanctuaries and a monument to take care of. These are very high visibility areas. There's some along the coast of California here, and some of you might have been there. Um, but they include things like the Monitor Wreck off the coast of North Carolina, on the Florida Keys, Fargo Banks in the Gulf of Mexico, everything from down in American Samoa, Hawaiian Islands, and up the coast of, of uh, California, including uh, the tops up there in the Olympic Coast. So we have a lot of 150,000 square miles of National Marine Sanctuary to monitor and to do research on next. And as part of that, um, we have a lot of creatures that come and go in, and one of them is this Hawaiian bug seal, which is house. what's not to love about that face. Um, one of the second most endangered marine mammals in the world. So um, there, there is a tremendous education initiative that goes on at the sanctuaries. Sanctuaries is one of the programs that's mandated by Congress to do, I don't know, to do education, and they get a significant chunk of change to do that. And as part of that um, education initiative, like they have developed some distance learning opportunities and telepresence technology. So to get up close to these beautiful areas, they're spectacular areas. And so they use a live interactive video feed and they have distance learning programs at various times during the year. These are available to visitor centers, museums, and science centers, and I don't know, maybe the Exploratorium has tied in probably to Monterey Bay, probably I'm guessing, uh, at some point in the past and web learning, web-based learning tools. Um, they have done some tremendous pilot projects with this, but they're just, again, in their infancy, infancy in trying to get the technology useful to museums and classrooms around the country in a way that is a regular part of their classroom, you know, their classroom activities. Next. Oh, I should mention, it's okay, maybe you stay here. Um, they are thinking about developing a mobile capability in which they would use a satellite, a bus, so fit with the sat satellite that would go around to these various sanctuary areas and possibly estuaries as well, do programming that they would feed to the satellite, which would be put onto the internet then and made available to you know, a wide cross-section of the United States. Um, that is still under development, and I don't know if it's going to go through, but it is a very interesting effort if they decide to do that. Roving programming. Um, so this is a, Oceans Live is the website where this, is, where this can be found, and they have a variety of activities over the year, including the, the Jason. Uh, we, have a, we give money to the Jason Foundation to develop uh, interactive programming, and the one this year is called Monster Storms. Um, they do live dive programs, Channel Islands Live, and immersion events. They did a monitor uh, expedition that, uh, that was uh, shot to Boys and Girls Clubs around the United States. Next. Uh, the other thing that uh, the sanctuary says in the, and this is where I think, we'll show the movie in just a second. Uh, the Aquarius is uh, an interesting underwater facility and they just finished an expedition in Aquarius with Aquanauts, in which six divers went down for a week to do some re research. But during that time, they had a tremendous amount. Uh, they had live webcams available online all the time, several of them in the facility. And 
then they did some live programming from the Aquarius. So let's go ahead and um, play that video. Because we have an 
presence in so many different states, we have a, a, a big interest in tying to the economic and cultural assets of each state. So the Sea Grants, of course, being a local institution, has a, has a, has a, a tie to the populace of the state. And we also are trying to get involved in some of the initiatives that has to do with how the oceans, coast, and atmosphere are tied to the culture. Um, and so in this case, we're worried about the, the changing culture of the northern um, indigenous cultures of Alaska, especially. Next. We also have 27 national estuary uh, uh, reserves, and each one of these reserves around the United States and one in Ohio have education coordinators. And they're in the process of developing an Estuaries 101 curriculum, which will be available online. And we're also in the process of developing what's called a Swamp Web interface that will have live, uh, live data uh, available for student use. Um, the trick is, though, how to help teachers use that data in, a, in an effective way in the classroom. So that, that is a challenge that we're also working on. Next. The estuaries also are a federally mandated program. They get money for education, and they have a, a robust program for developing that programming. And uh, the United States, of course, has a vested interest in understanding more about coastal processes, and especially coastal resiliency, which is a new thing. And that is, after a storm like Katrina, how do you help communities and the coastline rebuild itself? And that's pretty tough um, in some cases, because there's a lot of factors in, involved in uh, especially the loss of land and loss of productivity of some of these estuary areas. 20,000 acres of coastal estuaries are disappearing each year, and some of that has to do with sea level change, and some of that has to do with storms and erosion, and some of that has to do with human activity. So it's, a, it, it's very much a uh, looking at the interplay of science and culture when you're looking at things that impact oceans, coasts, and atmosphere. Um, the Estuaries Live program has been developed to help get those messages out to the public, and they happen every year. Um, these are virtual field trips. Um, this is the one from this year from South Carolina. Um, it's a satellite-based video. Stream program through the internet has web chat options. Uh, they usually have this uh, targeted to a K-12, um, more middle school type of audience. Teachers uh, have come to expect this over the last eight years, and then they and they and they tie into these, and the students offer them, offer questions. And you can see that last year, at least, they had four field trips that were done in one day, and with 23 students in attendance. And uh, 1,400 questions were generated by those students in that one day's time. So the teachers that know about this asset are using it heavily. And then they tie this in, go to the next slide, they tie this in to um, their curriculum because there's a teacher section here. There's a schedule on the left hand side, which is hard for you to see. But they have a various activities during the day that the teachers can choose to tie in when they think it fits their curriculum. Then there's a lot of teacher resources. And if you go to the next slide, Especially, there are some lists of activities and tied to, of course, national standards that teachers can use in their curriculum before and after the live feed. So the evaluation results from last year, though, indicate that teachers still struggle um, with finding ways to use assets like this in their curriculum. They have so many mandates and so many restrictions on what they're supposed to be doing in the classroom. They're having a hard time using these kinds of experiences to best advantage because of that time problem. And they, you know, the teachers also, it's nice to have a one-day field trip to an estuary like this, but what if it's the wrong time of the year for the curriculum? What's the flex, you know, how can we build in more flexibility to those kinds of real, real experiences for students? I think that's a challenge for all of us. Um, we also have, of course, a mandate for uh, doing education dealing with coral reef, coral reef conservation and research. Um, and next year is the International Year of the Reef, so you'll see quite a lot of activity regarding that, and hopefully there'll be a lot more online assets as well. Next. Um, we're very worried about the reefs, and you can see in this case, especially um, because of humans' disturbance, global climate change, we're losing a lot of our reefs, and there'll be natural resources, which in some cases are not coming back. I put in this example from Palau, um, in El Nino, that happened about 10 years ago, um, a third of the corals died, and in some places, 90% of it was affected. 
and it still hasn't come back. So we're, we're very concerned about ongoing uh, global warming and climate change issues with coral reefs. And then what happens to the economics of the area or what happens to the rest of the ocean ecosystem when you completely destroy habitat like that, and which cannot, cannot recover. Next. Um, we've done some very interesting things within NOAA. And, uh, what we're trying to do now is to respond better to today's kids. And I just put in a couple of slides, just because I, I as a former classroom teacher, I, and working in a federal agency, sometimes I have to remind the people that work there, some of them, most of them have never been in a classroom. Most of them, they were in a classroom, they were there as a student, not as a teacher. So what you will find in a lot of, I was talking to Dave about this before, in a lot of, in a lot of federal agencies, a lot of people who are education managers have never spent a day in, as a teacher in the classroom managing kids, K-12, K-20. Um, and because of that, you have a different, a different perspective on what's a, what's a good program. Um, sometimes they don't understand the, the, constraint, the constraints of teachers today are under. And if you haven't been in a classroom in the last five years, Teachers are telling me that I have good friends that are still in the classroom. I've been out for seven years now. They say, you know, you wouldn't believe the classroom that it is now compared to even five years ago. If you haven't been in a K-12 classroom in five years, you need to go visit because it's different. And they're under a tremendous amount of stress. And that's one of the things that we need to do as managers of programs, I think, at a national level, is to listen to the teachers. So one of the things we did this summer was have a focus group. We brought in the teachers and said, what do you want? What do you need? How can we help you? It's a need, you know, it's being needs, needs driven. Um, and I think it's very important to find out what, is, what are their issues and how can we reach them better. Um, so I threw this in just because we have to realize that students, not only is teaching change, but the kids have changed. They're different now than they were 15 years ago. And uh, they're tremendously plugged in, and I think you know that. But what I think is very interesting is that they live in a media-saturated environment, but they're also generating web content. I threw this up because I can has cheeseburger.com. If you don't know, know, know about that site, kids are putting their make generating content in a tremendous way. They take these pictures and then they put captions on, for example, and then they post these post these pictures. And this is these are young kids. This is not you know teenagers. These are young kids that are picking up pictures and they're tremendously plugged into generating their own content. And I think that's a challenge for us as as program generators. How can we generate a program that's A, attractive to this kind of student, and B, engages them in a way that's actually going to teach them along the way? I think it's a tremendous challenge for us. Yes. So, uh, so, you know, if the, the general students are goal-oriented, how can we give them new goals so that we can get learning in the back door? So we call it sneaky learning. Sneaky learning, I think, is, is something as a former teacher that I think we really need to be aware of because I think it's something that we can use with digital kids. And it's things like Second Life, and it's things like having them generate content that they can post and share with their friends. It's having them be collaborators online. It's having them work um, with challenges that are socially, that have some social aspects to them because that's what the students are being driven in. That's what they seem to like. Um, so what we've got is four goals in the National Ocean Service, and we're trying to provide some new avenues for science content, and that includes expanding our audience to K-12. We've been focusing kind of on the high school. It's really easy to write for high school and above. What's really tough is writing content for younger children. And it takes special skills, special methodologies. So we've hired people who are experts at writing for children. Um, and I think that's an important way to generate some new content and also to develop some professional development. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. We're trying to increase our evaluation efforts. OMB, Office of Management and Budget. We live and die because of the money that we get from Congress. And the oversight of that is from the Office of Management and Budget. And they're looking for more rigorous evaluation. So everything we do, be it online, be it programs, whatever, has to be more rigorously evaluated. That's something that a lot of federal agencies haven't done a very good job of. Um, and then we are trying to increase our partnerships both within NOAA and then increase our partnerships without, you know, with other federal agencies and other partners, including higher ed institutions, museums, and informal institutions. Yeah. 
So next, we have goal one. I told you we're trying to reach elementary and middle school students. One of the efforts I wanted to talk to you about is gaming. We're just developed a partnership with a local community college that has an interactive simulation gaming track. And we're hiring students to develop games for us you know, using the old content. They're having a great time. Their first game is going to be on estuaries. And they are developing a game that is probably for middle to high school students. Um, that will ask the students to do a series of challenges, and then they can move to the next level. And by solving those challenges, then they learn more about what estuary is about, what the issues, and how they can restore an estuary for a that's been damaged by a hurricane. Um, then the NOAA Waterways program is something that we have started last year as a pilot program. And the second year, it's applied science, math, and technology with investigative challenges for grades three to eight. Here on the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about that particular one. This is definitely a very open inquiry, and inquiry is a word I think that sometimes is misused, um, but could, because it can mean many, many different things, and I think one person's definition is probably different than another person's definition, but we're doing this in a very open inquiry way in which we started with saying, asking the teachers what did they want to know about oceans, coast, and atmosphere, and they told us. And then we asked them to go out and do the same thing with their students. And then we asked them, what do you know about it already? And what don't you know? And then what we'll, what we'll do is we'll fill in your gaps with professional development on a needs based basis, a needs assessment basis. And then we had them do the same thing with their students. And then the teachers helped develop some scenarios and challenges that their students could do and find out about uh, various aspects of, for example, the Gulf Stream. How does the Gulf Stream affect climate on East, East Coast cities? Uh, how does the Gulf Stream affect shipping? How do, uh, mer how does marine weather affect ships that come across uh, the Atlantic Ocean? We focused on the Atlantic as the teachers on the Atlantic seaboard. Um, and then the, the PBL student units, these problem-based learning units, were actually developed by the teachers. We supported them with materials, scientists, professional developing, development during the year, some after school, some at night, some on the weekends. Whenever, we, whenever they needed it, we, we delivered. And then the teachers worked with their students over a several month time period. Then te the teachers asked their students to keep journals, either electronic, with electronic portfolios, or paper, pencil. And then the students developed presentations, which they gave to NOAA scientists in the spring. And scientists gave them some feedback on their results. Um, it was a tremendous, uh, tremendous effort by some of the NOAA scientists. Next. And we found some very, uh, we found significant learning by both teachers and the students in our first year, so expanding. Um, because this was very well accepted by the teachers as a great way to in, input live data in the classroom. And so the teachers said they learned uh, PPL, implementation utilization. What's the difference between hands on and inquiry? Um, how to find resources and data, how to use concept maps and evaluation, building rubrics. And uh, average teacher confidence rose spectacularly. We were incredibly happy with the results from the teachers on this project. Yes? Do you have a website for that? Um, no, I don't. But I can give you, I, I, uh, not on this particular project, no, we have not developed that yet. Because last year was the first pilot. I've got a report I can send you. Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely available. Go to the next slide. The students had great results as well. Students recorded significant increases in interest in knowledge, their ability to develop presentation, use of the internet to find data, and ask questions as a way to learn. Um, the, the students were ecstatic about this. We had students that were uh, from a wide range of schools. Uh, some were very uh, gifted and talented program to, to students in a magnet school in science and technology, and some students came from uh, low income, uh, everything from socioeconomic low to high. So we're very happy with that. We're expanding this, this year to uh, some other teachers and areas. Next slide. Um, we also I mentioned that OMB is asking for more evaluation from federal agencies uh, to show uh, to show results and not output outcomes. And so we're trying to increase uh, our efforts. I told you about the web channel that we had. We learned a tremendous amount from the teachers about what they want in terms of online resources what they have for both access both in the classroom and out, and how the students use the internet, and how they think we could do a better job at providing services to them. 
Um, and I think it's a, that was a, such an important effort to get feedback from the teachers, the users, that we're going to continue that this year. We're going to go to the students next, and then we're going to keep going to the teachers because I think it's very important to be to have an informed effort um, by the user population. It's sometimes I think a bit arrogant for us to assume that we know what the teachers want. And I think we need to go out to the teachers and ask them what they want. And sometimes we don't do that enough, I think. Um, we had a grant from uh, downtown office of education to uh, evaluate the usefulness and effectiveness of our online learning environment. And we're in the middle of that process right now, so I don't have any results to share with you. Um, but we did use an external evaluator for that. We had a series of workshops. Teachers are using materials and did, we're doing pre and post um, work with them, asking how they're implementing and using online resources. We should have some data uh, next spring on, on what the students and the teachers learned as a result of that effort. And then uh, we're increasing the, the rigor of our new program development, like in a lot of those things. <clears throat> the other thing I should say is that we do web statistics on all our web stuff, and we take a look at what are people using, and um, you know, what, what, what's the hot topics Finding that climate is, is becoming a hot topic for teachers. There's not a lot of good stuff out there, and they're looking for it right now because it is a topic of interest. Um, we're trying to increase our partnerships with NOAA. We have a, an education council and an ocean service roundtable, and the first thing we're going trying to do is to build capacity for distance learning, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, is to try to find out how we can expand our opportunities and what should um, an infrastructure look like. We do want to have a multi-purpose digital learning infrastructure, and we do have some money this year. And we have some, and so we're trying to figure out what is it we need to build, uh, what capabilities should we be putting into this, and uh, and what what kinds of services can we provide to higher ed institutions, to museums, and uh, science centers, and so trying to trying to do some dreaming right now because there is some money there. Um, and also, we, we want to continue to work with the National Science Teachers Association. They have a tremendous number of, of online, electronic, professional developed assets, and they have an EPD portal that's in its beta uh, version right now. Basically, a teacher would be able to go there, take a test, find out what they knew or didn't know. The, the program would come back and prescribe for them a, a course of science objects, um, or courses that they can take and then receive certificates as a result of, of having completed that. And a number of the growing, the growing number of science objects that are available through, uh, through that, and all the science objects are available for free. They've been funded by a variety of federal partners and now a major corporation, and so all the science objects dealing with, I think there's 32 major topical areas in science uh, that have been they're on the drawing board, they're either under development or been developed, and they're available online for teachers to get up to speed on the content. And if, if you don't know about that, I can fill you in on that more. We also have some, what's called side guides. They're science two boxes for teachers showing them where websites are. You might be interested to see if you folks have some of your assets on those side guides, because that's where the teachers are being pointed. And they've been vetted through a system to look for inquiry, uh, for assessment, effective stress assessments, um, good websites, stable websites, um, and it would be maybe good for you to do a little um, sleuthing to see if you have your assets on those as well. Web seminars have been tremendously popular. Uh, these are getting NOAA scientists online for a web seminar using like a WebEx technology. And the teachers, we had one of them, had 100 teachers from all of the United States Hawaii, Alaska, American Samoa, online to learn about, in this case, uh, virtual globes. It was a very popular topic. The other one on geocaching and benchmark hunting was very well attended as well. Teachers love these, about two hours of their time. They can sit at their desk in their bunny slippers with a beard and learn about something from, a ch from the chief geodesist of the United States. Now, what's not to love about that? And it's free, because the science agencies have paid for this opportunity. So what, you know, they love it. And they sign up for these on an increasing basis. In fact, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, we capped out on the virtual woes. People were turned away because we didn't have enough seats in the house. 
for them. So web seminars are starting to get to be known in the K-12 population, especially those that are tied into National Science Teachers Association, has something that's very worthwhile in their time, because they find out about some of these hidden nuggets, these great websites that are so difficult to find. And teachers, we found out this summer, they want help finding stuff. They know there's a lot of stuff out there on the web, but they don't have time to look for it. So they want to know where the good sites are. And they're coming to these seminars to find out. So we're going to be uh, funding an, uh, an increasing number of these web seminars. Because the other thing is because NSTA has the advertising pipeline. If Noah goes out and says, we're going to have a web seminar, we get five people there. NSTA sends it out. They send an e-blast out to 250,000 people a week. They can fill them up. So we figured out that we're, our, our advertising pipeline is to go through the National Science Teachers Association. I mean, they've, they've got the publication mechanisms, both to members and to non-members. People know to go to them for that kind of professional development information. So that's what we're using. Um, next. So we're, we're trying to work on a digital learning initiative, including webcasts, video conferences, podcasts, websites, and so on. We're trying to increase our visibility, but all those assets I've been talking about, the Oceans Live, the Estuaries Live, some of the stuff with Noble Waterways, the Aquarius, all of those assets, they're scattered all over the place, you know, like a shotgun pattern. Teachers have to go to many different places to find them, and we want one-stop shopping, so we're trying to get this all pulled together. NOAA is where NASA was about six years ago. NASA was little individual centers doing their own little programming, and all everybody was, you know, kind of protecting their own turf. No one's in the same job and the same thing right now. And now NASA's got a wonderful digital learning network that's been pulled together in a cohesive way with one place for scheduling. You've got people that talk together, people that plan together, you have common, uh, common templates for activities. Um, people know when they go to get a program, any number of 50-some programs or whatever you guys have on that system now, they know what they're going to get, and they know what their expectations are, and they know how to hook in. No one doesn't have that yet, so we're just starting again from scratch. Um, we need to reach more audiences. We've got tremendous assets. We just need to get it out there and get it organized. So we're looking at an infrastructure, and like I said, we have money. Next slide. So we're trying to get it all put together. Finally, we are very active within the International Polar Year community, and we'll be working Starting, we're starting to work already on the International Year of the Reef. We have an interagency group that's working on a climate kit, and that includes some other federal partners that we are, we are starting some conversations. So the EPA, Bureau of Land Management, NASA, of course, at the table, National Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife, National Park Service, all these people, climate's been a dirty word for a long time. And global climate, global, global warming's just not even mentioned. But all these people are starting to talk Climate is kind of the glue that's making us talk together. So maybe as an outgrowth of this kind of thing, we can start doing more with distance learning. Because we're starting to get some of the education people at the table, which is a good thing. Um, and then the, we have a distance learning partnership with NASA. I'm writing up the agreement, the memorandum of understanding right now. And we'll have a formal agreement between NASA and NOAA. We'll help NASA develop some content, and they're going to deliver it on their network until we get our network built. So there will be more, more opportunities for teachers and teachers. Next. So, we got a lot of work to do, but we know it's going to take a long time. Uh, the oceans, about 5% of the deep ocean has been explored. We know more about the moon than we do our own ocean, so we have a lot of work to do. Um, but the exciting thing is that now there's some technology that will help us get that job done. So, next. So, if you have some new ideas and new contacts and some new connections, Trisha and I are willing, you know, ready, willing, and able to listen. I should tell you just a little bit about Trisha. Trisha is from the La Jolla. Uh, office. She has a, actually a space in the Southwest Fisheries uh, unit of the National, the National Fisheries Service here in La Jolla, and she is one of our web gurus and helped us put together a CD, which is sitting in my desk there. And if you would like one, more than one, we do have a website, oceanservice.noaa.gov, um, that has a lot of tutorials and lesson plans and everything on. But I focus mostly today on distance learning. We have a lot of stuff online. Kind of like all the other federal agencies. We have a lot of stuff on them. The problem is you've got to be able to fund it. Um, so what we're trying to do is to get it all in, put it into one place. And Trisha is uh, 
also was responsible for putting together a multimedia gallery that we would eventually like to have on uh, available for more content. I think right now you focus on mostly on fisheries content, which had to do with lots of really fun stuff. Podcasts, video casts, YouTube, ROV uh, video. video. Okay, and it's all online. I was doing a look, a look around. What's the website for that? Surprising to me is that there's a, and maybe if you look for this data, because it's all online. But if you have a specific type of data that you're looking for, we can find it. Uh, I was thinking of different types of atmospheric research. Mm -hmm. um, well, most federal agencies do a pretty good job getting, them, getting their data online and available, and I know the climate data and weather data is very accessible, but you have to know where to look. So it should, it should be online. If not, I know we can get you to, to the people who can get you tied in. I'm actually curious about getting things that aren't on my Okay. It's all public domain if it's from a federal agency. That's why it's if it's online, it's free to use. And the video conferences are, are, are fine too. Yeah, but we, if you want to email me, I can try to get you in touch with the right person in our satellite division. Any other questions? Thank you, Peg, very much. I, I have um, some thoughts about uh, how, how we might continue this conversation, but I 